Well, thank you, Alan. It was a suitably embarrassing introduction. For you or me? Certainly for me. Now, let me at the outset thank uh, Alan and, uh, and the University of Ottawa and the grad school here. Um, very happy to have uh, Chancellor Huguet, who is also a friend, who has made time to come here. She's also the global chair of Transparency International, which is a key partner of Amnesty, so I recognize that. But uh, coming to the subject of today's discussion, I speak with great humility, as I'm sure there are many in the room here who have far deeper knowledge of this part of the world than, than we, uh, Middle East and North Africa. But the events of this year have significant implications for all of us, whether or not we are experts in the Middle East and North Africa. Indeed, for the greater part of the last 50 years, since its inception in 1961, demanding change in the countries of the Middle East, North Africa, and other parts of the world is precisely what Amnesty International has been doing. The change we seek is getting governments and other key actors to live up to their human rights obligations from upholding the rule of law and eradicating torture to assuring women's rights and eliminating discrimination to providing uh, their citizens with an adequate standard of living. We've been demanding that governments and those holding power live up to the values and standards articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the human rights treaties that build on it. And in pursuit of a world where everyone enjoys all human rights, Amnesty International chooses to link up individuals across the world to respond to the abuses we document and put pressure on the powerful and express solidarity with the victims and the many human rights defenders who struggle across the world often as at great personal cost. And I'm happy that Arar is here and many of you know the story in great detail. We now have over 3 million regular paying members across the world campaigning to protect and promote human rights. In these remarks, I will seek to set the context in the Middle East and North Africa from our human rights perspective, highlight the recent changes and provide some thoughts on the ways forward. Now, looking at the states that comprise the Middle East and North Africa from Morocco in the West to Iran in the East, including the sort of states around the Gulf, it has to be said that the past few decades have been pretty grim, with the majority of their populations having little or no voice. The region has been beset by international and internal armed conflicts, wars between Israel and its neighbors, between Iraq and Iran, and in the Gulf, culminating in the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, whose impact is still being felt in Iraq and the region, and now, of course, the international action against Colonel Gaddafi's despotic regime in Libya. There have also been devastating internal conflicts, such as that in Algeria, which caused tens of thousands of lives and whose unaddressed legacy of gross abuse and injustice continues to hang heavily over and divide Algerian society. Or Lebanon's 15 year long civil war from which so many thousands remain missing and unaccounted for 20 years and more after its end. Each day, relatives of the disappeared still gather in a Beirut park to remember their loved ones, to ask what was done to them and by whom to seek truth and justice that is due. It is a most poignant but also a most inspiring sight, this group of now elderly people who keep alive the memory of their loved ones in the hope that they will yet emerge, possibly from a Syrian prison. Many of the disappeared were taken by Syrian forces who were then present in and controlled much of Lebanon, or that their remains would be found, allowing those who remember them at least to have a place at which to grieve. Incidentally, we will shortly publish a new report on Lebanon's missing and disappeared as part of, as a part of our efforts to uh, support those families and the work of local Lebanese partner organizations. They continue to press their government to address this legacy by investigating, identifying and protecting mass graves and establishing a system whereby relatives of the missing can provide DNA in order to help with the identification of those whose remains may yet be found, even after they are the relatives may have passed away, as some already have. So the past five decades, very largely, have not seen much realization of the values and rights set out in the Universal Declaration and the raft of international human rights treaties adopted since, such as the UN Convention Against Torture, or that on the elimination of discrimination against women. While most Middle Eastern and North African states have signed on to the majority of these and have been eager to take seats on bodies such as the UN Human Rights Council, 
generally the practice at home has not suggested much commitment to these treaties or to what they were intended to achieve. On the contrary, governments throughout the region, whatever their political persuasion or religious affiliation, have tended to rule through the use of force and repression, stifling dissent and debate, jailing or even killing their critics, rigging elections in their favor, banning opposition parties, politicizing law enforcement, and undermining other institutions, legislatures where they exist, and the judiciary, to become unquestioning appendages of those holding executive power. Amnesty's work during this period has been to intervene on behalf of those targeted because of the exercise of free speech, or because they have stood up for their rights, or of others, or because of their identity. For those abused by security police, who so often are allowed by their masters to torture or even kill with impunity. For those jailed after grossly unfair trials and those facing execution, including juvenile offenders sentenced for crimes committed when they were under 18. Iran, for example, and we just released our death penalty report last week, uh, ranked second only to China in the gruesome tally of executions by states. In 2010, Amnesty International recorded 242 executions in Iran. But the real total may have been twice that, as we have received unverified reports of another 300 executions in one prison alone. Many of those executed, who include political prisoners, did not receive fair trials. So the need for change in the Middle East and North Africa is compelling. And people all across the region are demanding change now and have shown themselves willing to make great sacrifices in order to achieve it. Today we are experiencing truly momentous times for the region and its people. The events of the past three months are, or so are likely to be seen by future historians as signaling nothing less than a seismic shift, a huge step forward for people and for people's power within the states of the region. Uh, you will recall that the spark, literally and tragically, was lit by a young man in a town in Tunisia. On 17 December, Mohammed Bozizi, an unemployed 24-year-old set himself alight in an act of desperation and despair after a local official prevented him from selling vegetables from his handcart and reportedly assaulted him. Mozizi died a few weeks later from his burns, but by then, thousands of his fellow Tunisians, including many youth, had taken to the streets to vent their frustrations over growing impoverishment, a lack of jobs and opportunities, police brutality, and the state repression that had become so entrenched under the long rule of President Ben Ali and his rapacious family and cronies. True to form, the Ben Ali government resorted to force, shooting down demonstrators as they had done at a time of earlier social unrest in southeastern Tunisia in 2009. This time, however, the demonstrations would not be cowed. They braved the bullets and the beatings, and the rest is history. Ben Ali, shown of all support, lost his nerve and fled to seek refuge in Saudi Arabia. Events in Tunisia then acted as a trigger, inspiring millions of people in Egypt to take to the streets to demand an end to the long, corrupt, and repressive rule of Hosni Mubarak in power continuously since 1981, and maintained in that power by a national state of emergency of similar duration, a compliant parliament, weak judiciary, and unaccountable security forces at hand to do his bidding. If what was achieved by people's power in Tunisia was astonishing, what people's power achieved in Egypt, the most populous Arab country and the strategic hub of the region, was even more incredible. People from across the political spectrum, people of all ages and throughout Egypt, came together in one great movement to demand change, reform, new hopes and prospects, and an end to the exclusion from determining how and by whom they should be governed. After the successes of Tunisia and Egypt, similar protests for change have occurred in many countries, and I, I'm not even sure I need to describe this because the media has been covering it in so much detail. So while on the one hand celebrating the newfound freedoms that people in Tunisia and Egypt are able to taste, we are now witnessing an all too predictable fight back by the leaders and governments now facing their people's challenge. And the result so far is much more bloodshed and repression in Bahrain, in Iraq, in Syria, and elsewhere, and especially now in Yemen the poorest country in the entire region, and in Libya, which has the richest oil reserves in the continent of Africa, but whose resources have been diverted largely to support the personal and political interests of Colonel Gaddafi and his clan, rather than shared equitably with those to whom they really belong. 
Our staff on the ground in Benghazi, in Libya, and several other, other countries of the region are painstakingly recording the large number of violations that persist. The calls for change in the Middle East and North Africa have some common themes. The poverty of the many in face of the excess of the few, the lack of jobs and opportunities for the young, marginalization of whole communities, the voicelessness of women, corruption, government's failure to work in their people's interest, and their cynicism, police brutality, and oppression. Yet the protests in each country have also reflected some very particular grievances, many to do with the violation of human rights. In Libya, for example, the immediate spark for the protests was the arrest of a lawyer representing the families of prisoners killed by Colonel Gaddafi's forces at Abu Salim prison in Tripoli 15 years ago. That massacre, in which some 1,200 prisoners were killed, has never been adequately explained. Still less have those responsible been brought to justice. How could they be if the killings were condoned, perhaps even ordered at the highest level of the Libyan state, as they may have been? Families of those who were killed have related how they did not even know their relatives were dead until many, many years later. 